<laughs> Welcome to those who braved and come at, came out at 6 in the morning to start our 18-hour share. Um, and those who are watching online, um, now, that we are, now that we are live. Um, a special thank you to Serena and David Kaczynski and the Weinbaum Foundation for sponsoring the entire program. Um, thank you to Archaim for hosting the 18-hour share. Thank you to Peter Mikes, who's doing the webcast. Thank you, Peter. Um, and for people who would like to support the programming, today's funds will be used for, to support our university programming, our daily <coughs> shiurim, and learning opportunities for local male and female university students at our Beit Midrash here at Or Chaim, and the women's Beit Midrash at Ulpana Rot. And if there are any university students who would like to join, or anyone knows of university students who would like to join us, please feel free to give us their information. Um, for anyone who would like to donate, there are, there are cards at the door to Archaim, or you can donate online at www.toronotorah.com slash 18. As of uh, Motei Shabbos, we've raised uh, $7,000, which with our matching fund brings us to $14,000. Um, okay, so our, uh, our first cheer for the day is, uh, is Daf Yomi. Uh, today's Daf is Baba Kama Daf Kuf Yud. Um, we're in the middle of a discussion. We'll start a, a few lines down here on Daf Kuf Yud. Um, we're in the middle of a, uh, of a discussion of a Kohen who cannot do the, uh, who cannot do the Avoda himself or does not want to do the Avoda himself. So he deputizes uh, someone else to do it. Uh, really, we can start at the top of the page. We're in the middle, really in the middle of a sentence, but okay. So, If the Kohen, who's unable to do the Avodah, who's unable to work in the Beit HaMikdash, is, uh, is elderly or he's sick, and that's why he can't work, so he can deputize any Kohen that he wants, and, the, uh, and then the the meat from the carbon and the, the hide of the animal will go to the Anshe Mishmar, to the people who are part of the 24 divisions of the Kohanim, the rotations of the Kohanim that divide the work in the Beit HaMikdash every six months. So the says, Hai zaken ochole hechi dami. So what exactly is the case of this sick or elderly Kohen who doesn't want to work or can't work? So hechi dami idematsi avid avoda, if he could actually work in the Beit HaMikdash. He's just weak, so it's difficult, but if he wanted to, he could push himself and he could do it. So, So then he should be able to take the meat or the hides of the animal because in the end of the day, since he could do the work and he's deputizing someone else, so it goes to him. And if he's incapable of actually working in the Beit HaMikdash, Shliach Heichim Mishave. So how can he appoint a Shliach? You can't appoint a messenger for something that you are incapable of doing yourself. Now the Achronim divide on what exactly the basis of this rule is. There is a general rule that's discussed in the Gemara and Nazir. Now if you'd bet that whenever you can't make a Shliach, whenever you cannot appoint a messenger, you aren't allowed to appoint somebody else in your stead. Now normally... That, only, that limitation only refers to people who are halachically excluded from shlichut, or who, for whatever reason, halachically cannot engage in this act. Um, they are, for example, an eved, right, a slave who cannot perform kiddushin, who cannot get married. So he cannot act as a shliach or appoint a shliach for kiddushin. But normally, we do not limit people who can't perform the halachic act for practical reasons, because they're too weak, because they're too far away. In fact, that's the classic case of shlichus, where, I want, where someone wants to marry someone far away, and he doesn't want to travel, so he appoints somebody else, even if he can't travel. So some achronim do derive from this gemara, that in fact you can't make a shliach if you are practically incapable of sending a shliach. However, most of the achronim suggest that while this seems like that rule in Nazir, it's a different rule. And instead, what's going on here is that the only reason that the Kohen gets the rights to the meat or the hides of the Karban as opposed to the members of the Mishmar is because he could do the Avoda for himself and therefore he has the rights. If he can do the Avoda, so he can tell the people of the Mishmar, you didn't have any ability to get this meat or these hides because I could have taken it for myself. And since I could do the Avoda, so I could just give it to anybody else if I wanted to. 
But if he can't do the avoda, so the Anshay Mishmar will tell him, look, in the end of the day, you needed somebody else to do it, and therefore, you don't have any rights to the meat. This is not a normal rule of shlichut. It's unique to the rules of the Kohanim. So the Gemara continues, Amr of Papa, so it must be, He must be able to serve in the Beit HaMikdash if he really pushed himself. It would be difficult, but he could do it. So avoda dihi avid le ayudeh atchak avodahi. Now this worship in the Beit Hamikdash, if he does it, even when it's difficult, it will count. So therefore, he can appoint a shleach umeshav shleach. So he can appoint someone else to do it in his stead. Achila, but the meat that comes from the carbon, since he can't appoint a shleach to eat it, because dihi achal ayudeh atchak achila gasahi. Because if he eats it. And it's too difficult for him to eat. He could technically stuff it down his throat, but that would be considered achila gasa. That would be considered gluttony. Vachila gasa lav klumhu. And achila gasa, gluttony, doesn't count as eating halachically at all. And therefore, mishum hachi avodasa ve'orah lanshe mishmar. And therefore, he has to give away the benefit of this carbon to the people of the Mishmar because he actually doesn't have the rights to the carbon. Now, what exactly Achila Gasa is and whether it counts as Achila, there are different Gemara that point in different directions. Uh, the Gemara in the context of Yom Kippur assumes that Achila Gasa it does not count as Achila, does not count as food. Uh, the Gemara in Nazir Chaf Gimel discusses that by carbon Pesach, it sounds like it would be Achila. Um, so some of the uh, Rishonim, like Rabbeinu Tam, suggests that maybe there are two types of Achila Gasa. If it's simply that you're eating too much, so then it counts as Achila, but if you're stuffing yourself to the point where it causes you pain, then it doesn't count halachically as eating. Uh, others try to distinguish between different cases and argue that things like Yom Kippur, Achila Gasa doesn't count because you need a formal act of eating. By Karbanot, you might not need a formal Achila as much, because maybe the focus by, uh, by carbon Pesach, at least, is that the carbon be eaten rather than people actually eat it. But that is a discussion uh, in the post skim. So the Gemara continues. Amar of Sheshes, Im haya kohen tame be carbon sibor. If the kohen was impure and it's a carbon sibor. So now, if everyone's impure, so you are allowed to bring the carbon because tuma hutra bit sibor. So no snay in the kol mishayir. So you can give the carbon to everyone. Vavodasa ve'ora la'anshe mishmar. But the hide and the meat from the carbon will go to the members of this rotation. So, Echidami, what's the case? If there are pure Kohanim, so then the impure Kohanim are not allowed to do the Avod, they're not allowed to worship in the base of Mekdash. And if there is no one who's pure, Avodas of Aura Lanshe Mishmar, Hatmeim Ninu, then that would mean that the members of the rotation are also impure. So it shouldn't go to them either, because they can't eat it. So Amarava Ema Libale Mumin Tehorin Shibosa Mishmar. It must be that there are people who cannot worship in the base of Mikdash because they have a mum, because they have a blemish, but they are pure, so they can't worship. There's no one pure who can actually perform the service in the Bay of Mikdash, but they are allowed to eat it because they are still Kohanim. So Amarav Ashi, Imaya Kohen Gadol Onain, if the Kohen Gadol, if the high priest was an Onain, he was in the beginning. Uh, stages of mourning. He is, uh, right, his, it's before even the burial of his close relatives. So at that point, So he can deputize anyone to work in the Beis HaMikdash because the Kohen Gadol is allowed to work while he is an Onin. So he can deputize anyone to serve in the Beis HaMikdash. But he gives the meat and the hide to the people of the Mishmar. My Kamash Malon. What does this teach us? Tanina, it's a Mishnah Kohen Gadol, Makrav Onin, Ve'ena Ochel. He's allowed to serve while he's an Onin, but he can't eat it. Ve'ena Cholik Lechol Erev. And since he can't eat it himself, so he's not in charge of dividing the meat. Therefore, it has to go to the Anshay Mishmar. So the Gemara answer is Salka Dai Dechamina, Kichos Rachmana Ale de Kohen Gadol, Likeru Vehu. I might have thought that the Kohen Gadol, when he's an Onin, has the right, if he wants to, to do the service himself, but he can't deputize someone else, Kamash Malon, that in fact, since he has the ability to do the Avoda, and he can worship the Beit HaMikdash, he's also allowed to appoint somebody else to worship in the Beit HaMikdash. So now we move to the next Mishnah. So the Mishnah says, HaGozel es Hager. And 
the next shear will be uh, an eon shear on this topic of stealing from the, from the convert, from the proselyte. So the Mishnah says, Hagozel es hager, if one steals from a convert, vinish balo, and then the convert right, made him swear, he adjured him, and he said, promise me, swear to me that you didn't steal, and he did, and he swore falsely, umais. And now he died. So the halacha is when someone makes you swear that you didn't steal, and in fact you did, so then you're going to owe him 120%, right? a keren vachomesh, the principal, plus another fifth. So harezim mishalim keren vachomesh lekohanim, but the problem here is that the convert has no relatives, and he's died. So who are you going to give it to? Right? If he had no kids, and he's not halachically related to his parents, so there's a gzera sakasav, the Torah tells you that here God grants it to the kohanim in the Beit HaMikdash, so he will give the 120% to the Kohanim, Asham the Mizbeach, and he will give the Karban to the Mizbeach, meaning he'll sacrifice it. Shnei Amar, as the Pasuk says, Vim ein leish goel, la shiv ha'asham in love. If there is no redeemer for the person to give him the Karban, to give the, uh, the Asham, so then, ha'asham ha'mushav la'asham la'kohen milvad el ha'kipurim, asher yichaper ba'o alav, so then it goes to the priest in addition to the karbanot that they are getting as part of their normal rotation. If he was in the middle of bringing it to Shalayim and then he dies, so then the money will go to his children. The carbon that he had designated will be put in the field to graze until it develops a blemish. And then you will sell it, and you'll take the money that you got from the sold carbon, and you'll use it for voluntary carbon note. As Rashi notes, we always want the mizbeach to have carbon note on it. We always want it to be full, so we have a, uh, a reserve of carbon note, just generic carbon note that we bring on the mizbeach. If no one else is bringing carbon notes, we bring a carbon from this voluntary fund. And it at least keeps the Mizbeach busy. So, Nasan HaKesef, Le'anshe Mishmar, if you give the money to the members of the Mishmar, Umeis, and then you die, Ein HaYorshin Yechon Lahot So even though we'd said that if you die, the, uh, the money does not go to the Kohanim, if you already gave the money, even though you didn't finish the process and you didn't bring the Asham already, to the Kohanim, to the Mizbeach rather, the children of the thief are not allowed to demand the money. Shnei because the Pasuk says, V'ish asher yitain la Kohen lo yihyeh. Because once you've given the money to the Kohen, lo yihyeh, it remains in his property. Now what happens if you give it li yehoriv, the kes, sorry, um, not that I guess it li yehoriv, let's say you give the money to, to yehoriv, meaning, when they divided up the Mishmarot, when they divided up the 24 rotations of the Kohanim, so one of the families was Yehoriv, and another uh, uh, of the families was Yedaya. So let's say you give the money to the family of Yehoriv. The Asham le Yedaya, but you bring the Karban during the week, during the rotation of Yedaya. Yatsa, so despite the fact that you've divided up which Kohen, which family of Kohanim gets the rights to the money, as opposed to the rights of the carbon, that's sufficient and you fulfill your obligation. Asham li Yehoriv, but this is only if you do it in the right order, meaning you give the money first to Yehoriv, and Yedaya is the following week. But if you give Asham li Yehoriv, if you bring the carbon, you bring the sacrifice before you bring the money, the kesef li Yedaya, but you bring the money later, so then, im kiyem asham yakrivu b'nei Yedaya, if the carbon is still around, so then you can bring it. The im lo, but if the carbon was brought before the money was brought, so then, yachzir v'yavi asham acher, you have to bring a second sacrifice. Shami v'gzelo achelo hevi ashamo yetza. Hevi ashamo achelo hevi gzelo lo yetza. Because if you bring the sacrifice first, so that doesn't work because, presumably, the reason is, because the point of the carbon, the point of the sacrifice is 
to atone for the sin that you did. But if you haven't yet actually atoned, you haven't brought the money you owe, so then what worth is the carbon? Right? This is the theme of Nevi'im Achronim. God doesn't want carbon out if you haven't actually fixed your ways. So if you haven't brought the money, you haven't actually fixed the problem, so then the carbon is meaningless. Once you've brought the money, you can bring the carbon whenever you want. So if you bring the carbon earlier during the, the week of Yehoriv, and then you try to bring the money the next, the, uh, the next week to Yedaya, it's not going to work. You have to bring a second sacrifice after you brought the money. But let's say you brought the money, but not all of it. You brought the 100%, the principal, but you didn't bring the extra 20%. And then you bring the carbon. So it's true that you still owe the 20%, but it's not a problem then the carbon will in fact work and you will not have to bring a second sacrifice. So the Gemara says, Tanur Abanan, Asham, moving to the Pasuk. So we derive from the Pasuk, Asham, when the word in the Pasuk is Asham, Zekeren, this refers to the principle that is returned, Hamushav, that is returned, Zechomesh, that is the fifth. Oh, Eno Ela Asham Ze'ayel. How do you know? Maybe the word Asham refers literally to the carbon that is brought, the guilt offering, to the ayel, to the ram. Ulamai nafka mina. What's the halachic difference between how you derive the different parts of this obligation from the pasuk? Lafuke midi Rava to exclude the position of Rava. Dama Rava because Rava said Gazel Hager Shechziru Balayla. Rava is a unique position. That the status of Gezel Hager is like Mishpat, is like judgment, and therefore it must be done. All parts of it must happen during the day. So if you return the stolen object of the convert, Balaila, at night, Lo Yatsa, you do not fulfill your obligation. Now the Mufarshim note that this probably is only true if the principle that you return doesn't still exist by day. If it exists by day, so it's true that you gave it at the wrong time. Okay, but he doesn't have to hand it back to you for you to hand it back to him during the day. The only problem is when the principle was destroyed during the night. So by the time you get to the day, it's no longer extant. But if you return it, only 50% of it or in multiple parts, lo yatsa, you're not allowed to do that. You have to do it in one shot, in one fell swoop. My taima. Asham karye rachmana. Because as Rava derives, according to this derivation, even the monetary component is called, an asham is called a carbon. And a carbon obviously cannot be brought in halves. You bring the whole carbon, you shecht it, you bring it. So the money is the same. There's a formal act of returning the money and it must be done 100%. Kishu omer milvar el hakipurim. Heve omer asham ze carbon. Because, but if you, right, if you derive that this is not the case, right, then this halacha would not be true. Um, but so the Gemara says that this is why we, we emphasize how you derive from the Pasuk, because Rava's rule um, is only true if you think that it is called uh, in Asham. But here is a Kishomer, Asham, Ze Karen. So Tanya Edach, the second Brisa, says uh, as follows. Um, okay. Ze, the. Sorry, Asham ze Karen. The word Asham refers to the Karen. Hamushav ze Chomesh. Or maybe the word Asham refers to the Chomesh. Or maybe the word Asham refers to the Chomesh. Lamai nafka mina. Watch the halachic difference. La fuke mi mas nisin. To exclude the position in the following mission. That it's not not on lois a Karen, but not on lois a Chomesh. That if you gave the principal but not the extra fifth, ain't a Chomesh me a cave. So that doesn't prevent you from being forgiven. So where it says, Adar Abba Chomesh me a cave, you should say that it does. Kishu Omer vehe shiv es ashamo biro show vichami shiso have omer asham ze karen. No, because since the asham refers to the karen and the, and the fifth is referred to a different part of the pasuk, so you see that the kapara of the karen of the principle is distinguished from that of the extra 20%. Tanya Idach, so another price that says, asham ze karen amushav ze chomesh uvegezel agarakasuv midaber. So the Gemara says, "Oweinu ella hamushav ze kefel." How do you know that we're talking about is gzela, meaning a not surreptitious uh, case of stealing? Right, gzela in halacha is a uh, when you steal in the open, and gneva is when you do it deceptively. You do it when no one can see you. So how do you know you're talking about gzela ger, where you steal it publicly, and not gneva, not where you do it privately, when you do it in secret? 
And therefore, the punishment would not be 120%, it would be 200% because Gneva is published with, it's punished with Kefel. The Gemara says, So when you say you return it plus a fifth, you're talking about something that you pay only the Karen. Right, only the principal plus the chomesh, but you don't start with 200%. But if we're talking about a surreptitious uh, case of stealing me in Geneva, so then we would start with 200% rather than 100 plus 20. So Gufa, Amar Rav, Gezal, Ager, Sheikh, Ziru, Belayla, Lo Yatso. So now we return to the unique position of Rava that if you steal at night, uh, sorry, if you return the, the thing you stole from the convert at night, it does not work. Hech, Ziru, Chatzan, if you return it in, he says, it also doesn't work. my time. Ashem kari rachmana, because we've called it a carbon, a sacrifice. Amar Rava. Rava further says, Gezel ager she'ein moshavir pruta lukal kohen v'kohen. If when you return it, there isn't enough money to give every every member of the a rotation of kohenim the mishmar a shavir pruta a minimal amount of money. So the yotza yidei chovaso. So you don't fulfill your obligation. My time. Why is that the case? Right. You would think you'd be able to return. Only the money that you stole, right? You stole $100. There's 500 ko on him. Okay, so it would be 20 cents each. Let's, for argument's sake, a put as a quarter. So it wouldn't be sufficient. But why, in the end of the day, you stole $500 and you returned $500? What did I say? 100, whatever money you stole, you returned. My time, a dechsev ha'asham ha'mushav. So Rav says, no, it says the asham that is returned, which implies There must be something which is worth returning to each kohen, or it is, in, it is halachically meaningless. So Gemara then continues, Boy Rav, ein bo lemishmeres yehoriv, v'yesh bo lemishmeres, and now we turn the page, lemishmeres yedaya. So let's say, there are 300 koanim for the week of Yehoriv and 200 for Yedaya. And then math will come out that for one of those Mishmarot, you will have a sufficient amount to give a Shavar Pruta to each. And for the other one, you will not. So Ma, what is the Halacha? So the Gemara says, Hey, Chidami, what's the case? If you gave it to Yedaya, meaning to the Mishmar, which had a sufficient number of people, and you gave it to them during their week, then there's enough money. It's not a question. Obviously, you gave them enough. It must be where you gave it to Yedaya during the wrong week, during the week of Yehoriv. So my what? Do you say that since it is not the right week, Right, this is not actually the people who are on staff this week. Velo klumhu, so it's meaningless. O dilma kaven lo chazi le me ikar liyadaya, aliyadadi liyadaya kaya. Or do you say, look, I understand it's the week of Yo Riv, but in the end of the day, I can't give it to Yo Riv because there are too many people for them to get a shavar pruta. So I was going to save it anyways for yadaya. So therefore, it doesn't matter that I gave it in the wrong week. What's the halacha take? Who the gemara leaves it unanswered. By Rav. Kohanim maushi yechalku gezel hager keneged gezel hager. So there's halacha. When you have, when the kohanim have karbanot, they're not allowed to trade the portions they get in karbanot because karbanot are not considered monetary. So you can't just say, I'll take this, you take that. You have to divide everything equally. So what about gezel hager? The money that goes to the, uh, to the mishmar from the gezel hager do you say that this is parallel to the carbonot, and therefore they get there whatever it is, 50 cents, and they can't say, I'll take the extra 50 cents, you take a little bit of extra meat, or you take from this gazelle gear, and I'll take from the next gazelle gear. You can't make trades, everyone just has to divide it equally, and that's all there is to it. Or do you say, that this is a monetary gift to the Kohanim, and therefore you're allowed to divide it like you could anything else, which is money. So Hadar Pashta, we and then answer it, Asham Kari Rachmana. You can't do it because it is parallel to a Karban. And this makes sense in the context of the Gemara, because as the Gemara has made clear, returning the Gezel is not just a monetary payment. It is kapara. It does atone for your sin. And therefore, it has certain elements which are common with the Karban, even though it is a monetary payment. Rav Acha, Rava, Masin, Lo, 
Rav Acha had an explicit statement to this effect in the name of Rava, and this makes sense again in the name of Rava, because Rava in general thinks Gezel Ager is parallel to the Asham, parallel to the Karban. Um, Kohanim ain Cholkin. Gezel Ager, Kenegit Gezel Ager. My Taima Asham Karye Rachmana, because it is in Asham. Now the Rambam here actually rules like Rava, even though our Gemara had started that, our, that the, the Drashot are not like Rava, based on the end of the Gemara, the Rambam seems to have derived that Rava was in fact the position we hold like because we quote him Allah and therefore he quote he passes like Rava across the Sugya. Okay, so then the Gemara continues by Rava. Kohanim begezel hager yorshin havu o mekable matanos havu. When we say that the Kohanim get the money from the Ger because he has no relatives. So how exactly did the Torah set up that obligation? Is it that they become his heirs and therefore they have the halachic status of Yorshim of heirs? Or does the Torah give them a gift? What's the difference? So for example, if they stole, if what was stolen was chametz, was leaven, and, and now it is past Pesach, so now it is forbidden. You can't get benefit from it. So the Gemara says, "E Amart Yarshin Havu Hainu Di E Hai Di Yarshay Morish V E Amri Mikable Matanos Havu Matan Matana Kam Rachmana Denis of Luhu Vaha Loka Loka Yahiv Lu Midi De Afra Ba Almahu." So by Yerusha, so this is a general issue in Yerusha. Yerusha is not viewed in the classic sense, though in certain cases it might be, but. We'll assume, and the way the Gemara here is assuming, that Yerusha inheritance is not considered a normal gift. Rather, as the, at least one side of the question goes, in the Rishonim, it's called Mimale Makom of the Aviv, or whatever the case may be. The heirs take their they take, fill the shoes of their parents, and therefore, Mimela, they end up taking the property from their parents. Therefore, even though Chametz on Pesach, because it's Asr Banna, because you're not allowed to benefit, has no monetary value. If it has no monetary value, you can't actually own it. So you can't be given a gift of Chametz on Pesach. If you are a Yoresh, if you're an heir, you're not getting a gift. You're just taking over the place of your father. And here too, the Kohanim are taking over the place of the, uh, the Ger. So then, even if someone returns Chametz on Pesach, which is valueless, it will still work. Because the Kohanim are simply filling the place of the, of the Ger, and therefore they're mimale mikomo, whether or not it has any monetary value. Or do you say it is a matana, it's a gift? And gifts, by definition, must have some monetary value. And therefore, it is afra be'alma, because it's azru ba'ana and must be destroyed, it's considered dirt, considered dust, and therefore it doesn't work. So the Gemara answers, Rabzira boy hachi. And Rabzira actually furthers the question. He says, Even if you say they are receivers of gifts, right? it's still not a question. Right? Because at the end of the day, it has to be, right? This is the gift that's supposed to be given to them. What am I asking you? Right? So he said, in the end of the day, you can return it. Because... Yes, it is a gift, but it's a special type of a gift. You have to return what you stole. If you stole chametz, you stole chametz. So here, even if it is a matane, it doesn't matter that it's chametz shavalav pesach. The question is different. Um, the question is if I was ki kami bailon kigon shenaflu lo eser behemos begezel ager. Let's say you got ten animals. He stole ten animals, and now you get them. Mechai ve la frushim inayu maiser alo. Do you have to give Maser Behema one tenth of the animals? Yorshin Havel, are you an heir? Da'amar Mar, Kanu Betvisas, Abai is Chayavin. And as we said, since you take over the property, you are Mimale Makom Aviv, it's not considered a gift. It's considered as if you already owned it. And therefore, just like your father would, oh, Maser Behema, would have to give the tenth animal to. My sir, so, so too you would have to, and therefore the Kohanim would as well. Or do you say they're simply getting a gift? And when you get a gift, if you buy or you get something as a gift, so you're exempt from giving 
Maser behema. My, what's the halacha? So Gemara says, Tashma. Esrim v'arba matanos kahuna nitnu la'aharon ulevanav. There were 24 gifts given to the Kohanim, to Aaron and his children. V'kula nitnu b'chalu pradu chlal uvris melech. And all of them were given with a chlalu pradu chlal and with the covenant of salt. Um, and therefore, kol ha-mekayman ki'ilu mekayim chlalu pradu chlalu prit melech. Anyone who gives and fulfills the mitzvah of giving the gifts of the Kohanim has therefore fulfilled this, uh, this covenant of the Klalu Pradu Chal and the covenant of salt. Kol over alayhem kilu over a Klalu Pradu Chal brit melech. And if you don't, you violate um, the Klalu Pradu Chal and the, uh, the covenant of salt. Ve'eluhein. What are the gifts of the Kohanim? Eser b'mikdash. So there are ten in the Beit HaMikdash. Ve'arba b'yushalayim ve'eser b'gvulim. Four in Yerushalayim and ten in outside of Yerushalayim and Eretz Yisrael. Eser b'mikdash. What are the ten in the mikdash? Chatos behema v'chatos ha'of v'ashem v'adai. So it is the, uh, the chatos which you can bring either, right? The sin offering when you perform a sin and you know you performed a sin. So then you bring either an animal or a bird depending. Those gifts go to the kohanim. Asham v'adai. So those are the five cases where the Torah says that you bring a carbon asham for a sin you did for sure. Asham talui. When you're not sure if you did a sin for which you would be chayev achatas. And as, we, as the uh, halacha is, you bring a chatas if you violate a carbon by accident, which you would have gotten kares if you did it on purpose. So if you're not sure if you did a sin like that, you bring an asham talui. The, uh, the Rishonim suggests that the reason is as follows. Because... When you perform a sin, so that creates some sort of blemish and that creates a danger to your soul. So, the way that you protect yourself is because you bring a carbon chatos. But if you don't know whether you brought it, so while you're trying to figure it out, so how are you going to protect your soul? So, you bring a carbon asham, which would protect you in the meantime. The chatos is brought, right, again, for having done the sin, bishogig. The, uh, the Rishonim debate why it is that you bring, need to bring a carbon. What did you do wrong when you did a sin by accident? So that's a machlok as Rishonim. Rav Luchensin liked to note this. The Rambam in Perakei HaLachavav in Hilchoshkagos says that the reason you bring a chatos, or seems to say the reason you bring a chatos is because even when you do something by accident, you are in fact guilty. Ra- the Rambam's language there is ilu badak yafe yafe. If you had checked it out enough, if you had been careful enough, you would have realized that what you were doing was dangerous, was a potential halachic iser, and you wouldn't have done it. So just like by mazim, when you do something in purpose, you're punished for actively rebelling against God. When you do something by accident, you're punished for being flippant with God's will. The Ramban suggests this as well, but his preferred shot, the, one, the only one he quotes in Chomish and Vayikra and Perak Aleph, and he quotes, quotes by, both positions in the Torah of Adam, is that no, perhaps the reason you bring a chatos is because sin carries with it metaphysical reality and therefore it makes you ill spiritually even though you didn't do anything wrong and therefore you need to fix that blemish in your soul. And that's why you bring a chatos. But again, if you don't know that you have to bring the garbage, you bring an ashram tali to protect yourself in the interim. The, uh, in the chuvos of um, the Sri Eish, he notes that this is parallel halachically to the model of the egl arufa and the death penalty, right? If someone kills, he gets put to death. But in the interim, if you don't know who killed, so Klal Yisrael is now responsible because they haven't yet found the murderer and they're responsible for having allowed a murder to take place in their midst and therefore you bring the egla arufa in the interim but if you find the person who's going to uh, be put to death you still put him to death despite the fact you brought the egla arufa because that was only a stopgap measure so anyways those are the first four gifts that we have in the mikdash the next are vizivche shalme tzibor the uh, the karbanot of the uh, right, these are public shlamim <clears throat> which, as Rashi notes, is kivse atzeret. These are the carbonate you, brought, you bring on Shavuos. Vilog shemen shel mitzorah. And when, when someone ends being a mitzorah, so you sprinkle the oil on, it, on his fingers, on his, on his ears, so the rest of the oil, right, it's only a little bit that you sprinkle. The rest is, right, a log is a lot of oil. The rest goes to the koanim. 
Umosara Omer, what's left over after you bring the, uh, the mincha of the Omer, right? When you, the, you bring the new, the, new, um, the new grain on Pesach, so you bring a mincha. And when you bring a mincha, so you take kmita, you take a handful and you put it on the Mizbech. The rest goes to the Kohanim, Ushte Alechem, and the two loaves of bread from Shavuos, Velechem upon him, and the loaves of bread that go every week on the Shulchan, Ushiyare Minachos, and every mincha. Again, you bring a, you do kmitza, you take the handful, the special handful, it's not five hands, it's three hands, you do this. The reason it works, parenthetically, is because for a mincha you need to do blila, right? You need to mix a certain amount of oil in to the flour. Now, it doesn't actually make it into a dough. The amount of oil, when you mix it into a mincha, Rabbi Liebdag, like saying he did this experiment, it changes the flour from pure flour into basically the consistency of packing snow. So you take three fingers, you put it in, and basically creates a snowball in your fingers, and everything else remains. That is kmitza, and what's left over in the mincha goes to the kohanim. Um, the arba Yerushalayim, the four gifts that you give in Yerushalayim are habichara, right? the firstborn animal, habikurim, the first fruits, this week's parsha, hamuram min ha the parts of the carbon that are taken from the toda, ve'el nazir, and the Carbon that the Nazir brings when he finishes his period of Nazirus. For Oros Kachim, the hides of the Karbanot. Vasara Bigvulin, and the ten that they get outside of outside of the uh, of Yerushalayim are Truma Utrumas Maiser, and a Truma in general, because it is a one of the Matan of the Kohanim, but it's Bigvulin, has some properties of Karbanot, as the Gemara notes in several places. It is considered Navoda, that is the Bracha, that is reflected in the Brachot. But it's not fully uh, avoda. Uh, Utrumas maiser, the portion of truma that you get from the maser given to the levim. The chala, which we keep even in chutz laaretz, though the original, the, uh, the biblical law is in Eretz Yisrael alone. Reishes hagez, the first shearings of the sheep. Va matanos, and the the matanos, the meat that goes to the to the kohanim when you when you shecht an animal. Why exactly we don't keep that? Lema says it is an interesting question, um, but we don't have time to deal with it. Now, Upidion Haben, uh, when you redeem a firstborn natural birth male from a y- family of Yisraelim, Upidion Peter Chamor, and the redemption of a firstborn um, donkey, which you redeem with a sheep, Uste Achuza, and if someone donates his uh, ancestral field to Cherem, to the Beit HaMikdash, and doesn't redeem it, so then it goes to the Kohanim, Ustei Cheramim, and ones which are dedicated to the Beit HaMikdash, V'gezel HaGer, and as we've been talking about, the money stolen from a Ger, who has no heirs, V'kakarit Mias Matana, the point of this whole thing was to show that you see that it is a Matana, and therefore they are not Yorshim, they, the Kohanim get it as a gift, Shma Mina, Mikabla Matana, Savu Shma Mina, and that is in fact how we paskin. So the last sugya here in our last few minutes is Nosan as a cast of Anshe Mishmar. When you give the money to the Anshe Mishmar, Sha'amar Abaye, Shma Mina. The fact that we say that you can split up the money and the carbon, and that once you give the money to the Anshe Mishmar, even though the guy then dies, that they keep it, even though he hasn't finished the process, he hasn't brought the carbon, tells you the Kesef Mechaper Mechta, that you at least get, it's not that you need both, until you get both, you have no atonement at all. You get atonement, half atonement, after you brought the money. And therefore, it was meaningful when you gave it to the Kohanim, and that's why they can keep it, even though you never brought the carbon. Because if they didn't get any atonement, it should have gone back to the heirs. The Gemara says, My time, a why? Because I died to the Hachi, lo yayv, like. Because you didn't mean to give it for this reason, Elameyata, the Gemara said, but okay, if that's the case, if you designate a chatas and then you die and you can't get kapara after death, that seems to be the assumption here that the Mepharshim wonder because there are places where it seems you can get atonement after death, but in this case we say you can't, and therefore, if the owner of the chatas dies, so you should just, rede- the, the animal should just go free because you never meant to bring a carbon that wouldn't atone for you. But why is it that that's not actually what happens? Instead, what happens is tamus, it has to die. So the Gemara says, It is that it dies. 
So and we have the same halacha by Asham that if the owner of an Asham dies, it doesn't go to Chula. And Ella nitekle iriya, it goes and you wait for it to get a mum, and then you bring the money as a carbon, as a nedava. Um, so the Gemara says, because kol shebechatos mesa ba'ashem roe. So ela meyata yivama shenafnu. So um, and again, that is also a uh, halacha. Oh, I skipped a line, didn't I? Yeah. Leifog lechulin da 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 chlo afrasha ashem nami hilchazak minor lano. That's also a zera zakatov. Because kol shebechatos mesa ba'ashem roe. So ela meyata. What about yivama shenaf love shenafla lifnei mukashchin? If you have a yivama. Who, um, who, right? A woman who her bro- her husband died, and now she didn't have any children, so she falls to her brother-in-law. But he is someone she doesn't want to marry. He, he has he's afflicted with boils. Tape up below chalitza. You should say she doesn't have to have chalitza. Died the law. Adachi lo kid shatzma. She never wanted to get married at all. If she knew, she would end up having to marry this brother-in-law. So the Gemara says, no, that's not true. Hasam anan sahade, and I just gave you the next two lines of the Gemara. She would get married anyways, because she's happy with anything. That a woman would rather be married than be in Amana, than be unmarried, and therefore she will marry the husband, even if there's a possibility she'll be, fall as a Yavama to the undisputed desirable uh, brother, brother-in-law. Now, there are obviously cases where this is not uh, fully true and there, you know, that she might not want to be married. There was, I'll just mention one case um, where there was a, Rav Amital had this case, where there was a man who uh, his brother, he was about to go to war and uh, his brother said, if you get married and you die in war, right, he was an anti-religious communist. He said, I will be ma'again your wife. Um, so she didn't want to be in that situation. There was a possibility he would die if she went to war. So Rami Tal came up with a solution to get married al Tanai. And he made it Tanai that she wouldn't be no fellas. Now that doesn't happen automatically. Because as the Gemara said, Tavla Mesev Tandu. But if you know that in fact the woman wouldn't want to get married under the circumstances, so at least under circum- circumstances, it's not totally pashut, but you can get married al Tanai to solve that problem. But it won't simply work based on your dot. So that is the end of shear number one. And now we move to shear number two in our 18 hours.